So we're going to be starting, we're going to really kind of cover Galatians chapter 1 and 2. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to read Galatians 1 and 2. It's going to be a lot of reading this morning, so I hope you can bear with me. But before we even get started with that, I just wanted to make the point that Galatians was is thought by most scholars to be really the, one of the first, or the first letter, epistle, that the Apostle Paul wrote. Written approximately A.D. 48. Something, uh, you know, later on down the line, he wrote some other letters around A.D. 65. So you can see that this was an early work of his. Um, also, one of the things, he he's writing it, I draw this little map a lot. Uh, this is the... the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and this area in between, this right here is the Mediterranean Sea. And so this down here is Egypt, okay? And so in between here is actually the land of Israel, which in the Old Testament what we're learning was that that was the land of Canaan before the Israelites uh, inhabited this area. Now one thing of note, now we're talking New Testament times, right? So we're talking New Testament theology. Which things are a lot different now. Jesus has come to the earth. He died on the cross. He's now ascended to the Father. And the, uh, the doctrine of the apostles and their understanding of the teachings of Jesus is really flourishing. But you have to understand that this is taking time. The book of Acts you know, is going over several, like at least two decades of, of time frame that we're going through chronologically. But one of the things that I will point out that we've been talking a little bit about in the Old Testament is the fact of Canaanite religion. We talked a little bit about that last week, not to get into it. I'm not going to even say what I said exactly last week, but where we talked about the Asherah poles and, and the obelisks and how they were these structures and, and these pyramids. And, and you find them all, all over the place, really, as, as you continue to move. And the main point that I wanted to make with all that is that this is an area called Asia Minor. And Galatia was really a region that was somewhere kind of in the middle. And it included uh, places like Lystra and Derby. And what I'm just telling you is that these are places that the Apostle Paul, on his missionary journey, he went on one, two, three missionary journeys. And he traveled by boat in the Mediterranean Sea. And as he stopped, he planted churches along the way. And so on his first missionary journey, he's stopping in all of these different places. And he's, and he's making converts, and then he's moving on. And then he'll try to stop back by on the way out to see how things are going. And the churches are flourishing is what's happening, okay? And so I just kind of wanted to give you an idea. So this, this area, it's called an isthmus because there's another sea up here, but it's a landmass that actually connected the east to the west. So when you get into here, you get into this area called Macedonia, and then Corinth is down here, and then over here you have Italy, okay? And so Paul's traveling all this area, and he's establishing these churches along the way. But you got to understand the logistics of it are kind of difficult for him because he doesn't have email, he doesn't have Twitter, he doesn't have social media. He can't just instant message someone. Mm -hmm. And so really what he has to do is he has to, he establishes the churches, he establishes doctrine, and then he moves on, then he tries to check on them when he comes back. But home base is over here, you know, in, in Jerusalem, right? And so when he comes back, it takes time. If he hears something negative going on in a church, he has to write a hand, hand letter. He has to give the letter to someone who's going to be on a ship, who's going to be going to these locations. And then finally the letter makes it there. And God only knows what can end up happening along the way. The reason that I talked about these little obelisks and Canaanite religion was because I wanted you to know that whenever I studied a lot of the false religions of the East and, and got into a lot of that, what we see is that there was certainly a spread from the early ages of civilization where false religion began to spread all the way from the East to the West. And that within this area of Asia Minor, they're just worshiping various forms of false gods, whether it be Diana, you know, and just these, these various false gods that are very similar to the Canaanite gods. But it's kind of like their own twisted, perverted version of what the Canaanites excuse me, were, uh, were worshiping themselves. OK, and so that's what's going on. So the, the, the letter to the Galatians is written by the Apostle Paul out of concern of something that he's heard about what's going on in the region. So Galatia is not just one church. When we 
talk about the letter to the Corinthians. Typically, it's, it's one church that the letter's going to, to the church of Ephesus. It's one church that the letter's going to. But in Galatia, once again, it's a collection or a group of cities that have various churches within them that are in a specific region. And, th and this is what's taking place in here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and go to the book of Galatians. We're going to start off in chapter 1. We're going to read... All the way through chapter 2, probably verse 20. And along the way, I'll just ask the Lord to lead me where we need to stop and kind of discuss some things. Now, <laughs> one of the other things that I'd like to talk to you about a little bit, because this is kind of Bible study also connected to it. We talk about the various types of genre of, li of Bible literature. Whenever you, whenever, It's important that we understand these things. Like you may never go back and use, even use these words. But it's good if we go over them on multiple occasions that you would understand the wordings themselves, okay, so that whenever you're studying something that you can try to visualize in your mind or make your mind aware of what type of literature you're reading. So what is, you know, most people know what the word means, genre, what does that mean? It's just like a topical way to categorize things, okay? So like in music, you have country and western, you have blues. Rock and roll, Christian gospel, genres, different categorizations. And in Bible literature, you have different types of literature. And so the book of Galatians is an epistle, so it's a letter that was written from someone to someone. But Galatians is interesting because, like for the first two chapters that we're covering this, this morning, it's narrative. So what is, I mean, if anybody knows anything about literature, what does narrative do I'm not trying to trick anybody. It tells a story. That's why when we have a movie that has a narrator in it, he's kind of telling the story for us. He's moving the action along. And so basically in this first part that we're going to cover this morning, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's narrating a story. He's going backwards into where he started with them, things that happened in his past, okay, to try to explain to them the dangers that they're facing, because of circumstances that are taking place, if that makes sense. And then, and after that, he gets, it gets much more theological. All right. So here we go. Galatians chapter one, verse one, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God, the father who raised him from the dead. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to spend too much time here because I do want to just try to read. But at the same time, I want you to see here that he's already making his argument. He's already saying, hey, listen, I'm the apostle Paul and my ministry wasn't established by men. My calling didn't come from men. My calling came from God himself. Now, one of the things that we have to remember about the apostle Paul was that his ministry was different than all the other disciples. OK, in that he did not physically walk with the Lord while Jesus was in his ministry upon the earth. Paul did not experience the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. The other disciples that walked with the Lord, spent time with him, lived with him, ate with him and were there when he died or they scattered when he died. But they also experienced him in his resurrection. The Apostle Paul is kind of like if you could say a little bit like a Johnny come lately. He just kind of showed up out of nowhere and all. And, and listen, he knew some stuff by the time he showed up. He knew some stuff before he even got saved. And so it really caused a big shift. It caused a little bit of a commotion. And the reason why is because most of the commotion was because there was a bunch of religion. And God knew in advance that there was going to be a problem with religion. And so therefore he prepared the Apostle Paul to come in. And to shake things up, to allow people to be able to get a greater understanding of what it truly meant to be saved through Jesus Christ. Now, you got to understand, if you've been raised, and I don't want, once again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but if you've been raised a particular way in all of your life, you were taught that something is the truth. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes showing up and he starts telling you everything that you believe is wrong. Come on. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you were saved before and you thought you were doing pretty doggone good. And then somebody came along and started talking about the message of the cross and started saying, dude, your works are not going to get it. All your sin and all this kind of stuff. And it's offensive, just like it was to Abraham. He said it was grievous to Abraham 
that he had to let Ishmael go a work of his flesh. Because many times in Christianity, we're so used to the works that we've been doing. And we're so proud of the works that we do, right? But anyway, Paul said, I'm not called by men. I was called by God. Verse 2, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. So he's also letting them know, listen, there are, there's a lot of brethren that are on my side. That wasn't necessarily always at first, but by the time he reads this, writes this letter, it is. Grace be to you and from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't put this in my notes, but I do want you to be aware of this. That that word in the Greek for revelation is, if you were going to write it in, in English, it would look something like this. Apocalypsis. And it also could be translated as apocalypse. It's the same exact word for the book of Revelation. And literally the word means to be unveiled. Something that was previously hidden that's now revealed, okay? Just as in the book of Revelation, what it means is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Here we talk about him every Sunday. We talk about him every Wednesday. We believe if we've been saved that he is real. His spirit lives on the inside of us. But there's coming a day, according to the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ will be unveiled. The sheet's going to be removed and he will be able to physically be viewed and seen by all men. And woe on that day to those who refuse to believe. Like you told Thomas, blessed are you. You saw and you believed, but blessed are those who didn't see. And yet they still believed. Amen. All right. He says, uh, yes, thank you. For I neither received it, but I was taught it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in time past. Now we've talked about this before in the past. How the word conversation in the old English is, is kind of an outdated word. And it really means lifestyle. It talks about the manner in which you conduct your business. So the Apostle Paul saying, you've heard how I used to handle my business back in the old days. Is basically what he's saying. In the Jews' religion. In other words, before I was converted. When I was, in, when I was following the religion of the Jews. How that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Literally, Means I put this in my notes, but I just didn't talk about it. It really means to, de to attempt to destroy it. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So what we have here is we have a person. You ever seen some, I mean, I don't really know how to make an illustration out of this, but you ever seen somebody that you worked on the job with that worked harder than everybody else? You ever seen somebody that if you watch them in athletics, they train harder than everybody else? That's what the Apostle Paul is in the Jews' religion. He's training harder. He's working harder. He's reading longer. He's studying more. He's being more zealous about the works of the Jews. And he's, he's on a fast track to become the, the, the greatest rabbi ever known, right? As a matter of fact, we're going to take a detour and we're going to hear a little bit of it out of his own mouth. But first, let's read verse 14. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. So something changed in the Apostle Paul. Let's take a quick look at the book of Acts. Uh, I was going to say Acts chapter 22, but we're actually going to move work backwards from there. And when I find the scripture, I'll let you know. All right. 
uh, Acts 21, verse 39. So this is actually the Apostle Paul right here in the book of Acts. Acts is the whole, the whole book of Acts is narrative literature. It tells a story of the, of the church, how Jesus had ascended and told them to wait in the upper room, that they would receive the gift of the Father, and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They spoke with other tongues. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They became witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outermost part of the earth, and now the Holy Spirit is, is spreading the gospel across, and people are getting saved. And at some point in time, we pick up on the Apostle Paul. He's been on one of his missionary journeys, and he's working his way Back towards Jerusalem. I can tell you, if you go back and you read a, a review of what's happening just on this trip here, there's been all kind of mess. I mean, he's been over here to the area of Corinth. He's come back through Ephesus. And whenever he went was in Ephesus, he came against their idols and it caused a big old uproar. They tried to kill him. Uh, you know, and, and, and just one thing after the other. And now he's making it back to Jerusalem. And in this situation, he's about to tell a story. But the reason that he's telling the story is because it was told in advance before he got back to Jerusalem that he was going around telling people that they should not follow the <laughs> Jews religion. OK, because there was a big old stink. And that this is all connected to the book of Galatians. There was a big old stink in the early church because you got to understand James, the Lord's brother, was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And everybody that was originally saved was very Jewish in their mindset. And once again, here we have a situation where nobody knows any better. I mean, you can say, yeah, but didn't the Holy Spirit just show them everything all at once? No, he didn't. He did not reveal to them all at once. But thank God, through the process of time and through the revelation, along with the Apostle Paul and the other things that were shown, the truth of God's what God wanted communicated came forth. Amen. But you got to understand that the first converts were Jewish and many of them were very Jewish in their mindset. And they felt very strongly about this concept called circumcision all right now it was one thing in their own culture as jews if they were going to circumcise themselves because that was part of their culture you understand what i'm saying but the real problem came when they started trying to tell gentile people that they had to be circumcised because now they were changing the true doctrine of, of, of salvation they were saying you had to add something to your salvation. And uh, in addition to Jesus, it's good that you receive the Lord, but in addition to Jesus, you also have to be circumcised. And it caused a big old problem. Listen, before, you, if you'll remember the story, before the gospel wasn't even going to the Gentiles. Remember that? They were just preaching to the Jews. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> what happened? Peter was on a rooftop at a man called Simon the Tanner's house by the shore. And he got it, went into a vision, and the vision was that there was a sheet with four corners that were stretched out, all manner of unclean animals, and it descended before Peter. And the Lord spoke to Peter in the vision and said, Peter, rise, kill, eat. And what did the Lord say? I mean, Peter said, no way, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. The Lord had to tell him this at least three times from what I remember. I'm kind of shooting from the hip. And finally, all of a sudden, knocking at the door is some servants of a centurion named Cornelius, who was a devout man who was serving the God of the Jews, but wasn't a Jew himself, and was asking God to give him more revelation about the truth. And all of a sudden, the Lord told him, you send some servants over to Simon Tanner's house, and you find this Peter, and you tell him to come on over. And so what ends up happening is, is that Peter goes over to his house, and he preaches the gospel, and these people get saved and baptized with the Holy Spirit, start to, start to speak with other tongues, and they knew that they had received the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The point was, is that that was the first time Gentile converts had ever come into the faith. So what the vision was all about, it wasn't about eating unclean animals. It was about showing Peter, hey, it's time now for the Gentiles to hear the gospel also. That's very paramount in the whole story of Galatians, right? Because of the fact that and we're not even done reading what we, what we need to read this morning. But because of the fact that Peter himself kind of slides backwards a little bit. So this whole situation is going on in the midst of the church, even to the point where in Acts chapter 15, there's a council that comes together. There's a council that comes together that says, hey, should we make the Gentiles circumcise themselves also? <clears throat> and, you know, Peter, because he's gotten this revelation, he actually stands up and says, no, 
Why would we put this burden on them when we know that what Jesus has done is the answer that we've been waiting for? Right. And so Peter at that time has a great revelation from the Lord. He sees the gospel go forward to Cornelius and, and the people in his house. He sees them saved. He sees them baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he says at the council, no, they don't need to be circumcised. And Paul was there. And then time passes. And as we move on, we're going to see. But this is what I, so. So <clears throat> what happened was is where we are in this book of Acts is that Paul's coming back to Jerusalem and now the word's gotten out because just even though they had the council, even though they all agreed, there's still people that are saying that they're sanctioned by James, but they're kind of like it's running amok. It's becoming a problem. Everybody's got their own little doctrine and their own theology and they're running around causing trouble. And what they're saying is, is that Paul's going around telling even Jews to forsake Moses, forsake the law, forsake the circumcision. And they're really painting him in a big way as a problem. And so he walks into the temple. He purifies himself because, listen, he ain't going to get in there unless he takes a vow of purification. So he gets in there. And the next thing you know, they want to storm him. There he is. He's the one. He's the one that's defiling the temple. He's the one that's defiling the truth. OK. And then all of a sudden he motions with his hand like crowds be silenced. Let me speak. And then he starts to speak to them in the Hebrew tongue. And the scripture says in the book of Acts that when they hear him speaking in Hebrew, that it just causes them to become even more like it just kind of stops them in their shoes because he speaks multiple languages. He's a, he, and the Apostle Paul is just such a, I love, he's probably my favorite character in the Bible because just of his intellect, his understanding of the scriptures, the fact that God prepared him in so many different ways. He was born a Roman citizen, but he was also Hebrew by culture. It's just amazing, you know, the things that God did in this man's life and through this man. But anyway, this is where we're starting, Acts chapter 21, and we're trying to get a glimpse of his life before conversion. Paul said, I'm a man, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. That means basically <clears throat> that he was born a Roman citizen, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And then and when there was made a great silence, he spoke unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, men, brethren and fathers, Hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he said, I am verily a man, which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. So that may not mean a whole lot to you, but it was huge to them back then. So basically what he's already said is, hey, listen, <clears throat> I was born natural born a Roman citizen. It's kind of like if you were born in the United States, you're considered a U.S. citizen. If you were born in the province of province of Rome that was recognized by Rome as it's one of its own provinces, which the city of Tarsus was, you were a natural born citizen of the Roman Empire. But then he but then he clarifies. He says, but hold on a second. I was born there. I'm a Roman citizen, but I was brought up in Jerusalem under the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the most powerful rabbinic Hebrew teacher known at that point in time. He was the best of the best. And, P and only the elite could really be students of Gamaliel. And so that had a lot of weight. It's kind of like saying that you graduated from Harvard. Okay, it carried a lot of weight. And so that's what he was saying. And I was taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. So in other words, I was just like you. And I persecuted this way. He's talking about the way of Christianity. Unto death, binding and delivering into prisons, both men and women, as also the high priest does bear me witness. He was there. He saw it. You can go ask him. And all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring. You remember that? That was the story in Acts chapter 9 where Paul's breathing threats, throwing people in prison. He said, you know what? I'm going to Damascus to the high priest. I'm going to get some letters. I'm about to turn this up a notch. I hate this way. I hate this Christian course. It's defiling true. Uh, you know, these Jews are getting supposedly saved, whatever this mess is. I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to bring it to an end. And went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound up into Jerusalem to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come near unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said unto me, 
I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Now listen, I know we've all heard the voice of God before. I know, I never, I've never heard him audibly. I've heard him deep down inside my spirit. I've heard God speak to me and I knew it was the Lord. I've never heard an audible voice from God. But listen, I've also heard stories of Muslims who have literally, they, they swear that Jesus appeared to them and did the same thing that he did for Saul right here before he, he and, and, and asked them, why are you persecuted? And they were radically saved, you know, and I don't listen. God does things. He shows up in people's lives <clears throat> when he has a plan. Amen. To work through them. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spoke to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus, and one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him, and he said, the, the God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarry thou? Arise and be baptized. Or wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Praise God. And so we see... Here, this radical conversion of the Apostle Paul, and that was where we kind of ventured off uh, from verse 15, telling that part of the story where the Apostle Paul saying, hey, this is what happened at my conversion. This is what was going on before my conversion. And he's basically he's saying all this to the Galatians because he's trying to really he's giving them a resume. He's reminding them. It's sad that he has to do it, but he's reminding them who he is and who. Who, what he's been called to do. Verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. We've talked about this before, how the word heathen simply means Gentiles that don't know the Lord. Uh, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem. I don't mean to belabor the point because I think I have it in my points, but once again, this is his point. Not by, not by man, but by the Lord. The calling comes from God. When I got saved, I didn't immediately go run to Jerusalem to hear what they had to say. I didn't confer with other men. But instead, he says, but I went into Arabia and returned unto Damascus. Now, if you go back and you read the story in the book of Acts, so the area of Arabia is somewhere down in here. There's like a Judean wilderness down up in here, which is near kind of where Saudi Arabia is. And so it's almost like we could envision the Apostle Paul. I'm not saying he was living in the desert as a Bedouin or whatever the case, but he, he was in a wilderness experience. And, and we don't really know exactly how long he was there. At least it sounds like there's several years that are going by in all of this. And there's a point to that also. But then he goes back to Damascus, and that was whenever he starts preaching Jesus in the synagogue, whenever he goes to Damascus. And whenever he's in there, people start to persecute him, and he has to be let down in that basket outside the city wall. I don't know if you remember that or not. But anyway, that's what happened there. Then it says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. So think about this. It, I mean, this is what it sounds like. He's never really met Peter. He's never really met any of the other disciples. <gasps> He's, one day he's killing Christians and then the Holy Spirit reveals to him and he gets converted. Amen. And he says, I didn't go up to Jerusalem right away to go talk to them. But instead I went to Arabia. And then when he goes to Damascus, he's preaching Jesus. Amen. Um, and then, then finally, after three years, he says, you know, after three years, I went and I, and I saw Peter and I was with him for about 15 days. But other of the apostles saw none except James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So once again, Judea is the southern portion of Israel. And this is where uh, Jerusalem is. This is where the, the, the first church was. Um, and he's talking about I was in this region here. 
And I was unknown, really, to the churches that were over here in the south of Judea. Okay? This, that where Peter and where all the disciples are. He says, but they heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. So the word's getting out. The apostle Paul's preaching the gospel. Amen. And, and they glorified God in me. Hallelujah. That persecutor, man. God, God saves the worst of sinners. Amen. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem. So you see this long period of time that's taking place. 14 years. We got a three-year period, and you know now we're up to 14 years. Now I got to tell you that in, somewhere in there, they sent Barnabas to go find Paul. They're like, man, this, this the church is blowing up. We need help. And what we've heard is is that this Paul, who's been converted, is doing some major ministry over there. We need him to come down here and help us. And Barnabas had already had a little bit of a relationship with him. He said, "Can you go find him?" All right. So Barnabas finds him 14 years later, went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and he also took Titus with him. Now look at this right here. It says in the next couple of verses, I went up by revelation and communed unto, communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So I went back to Jerusalem and the apocalypse that was given to me by Jesus, I went and communicated to them what I had received from the Lord that I preached to the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. In other words, all those disciples that everybody recognized, all those, nowadays, you know, everybody puts a preacher on a pedestal, which is really, I got a major issue with it. I've shared before, there used to be a Bible college that I went and visit one time, and I was walking, I was I drove up, I didn't know nothing about Jesus back then, but I was like, dude, are you even serious, bro? Like, they had, <laughs> they had this guy, he was the leader of the church, of the school, and one guy was carrying his Bible and another guy was holding an umbrella over his head <laughs> as they walked by. I'm like, dude, I don't know a whole lot about the Lord, but that's something to me tells me that ain't right. You ought to be able to hold, because I'm thinking to myself, dude, I knew this much. Your Bible's your weapon and you're supposed to be a soldier. So you're going to get caught on the battlefield without your own weapon? Something's not right with that. But anyway, uh, why did I say all that? I don't know. But, but oh, because those privately who were of reputation. So there were some that already had, they were the disciples, right? And, and they were being elevated. Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So the Apostle Paul, there's, there's a balance there. You know, it's like you don't want to lift up the man of God to a point where he's on a pedestal because only Jesus deserves that position. At the same time, in the real world that we live in, there's men that have influence. And if you just go up there and slap them in the face, you're probably going to hinder the work that you're trying to do. So the Apostle Paul is operating with wisdom and, uh, and discretion. He said, look at this though. He says, but neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. Really and truly, it's almost like the Apostle Paul brought Titus as a test case. So we've already had the conference in Jerusalem. We came to the conclusion that everybody shouldn't have to be circumcised. So I brought Titus with me because I want to see how you're really going to act because he's, a, he's Greek. And he's not circumcised. See, when, it, when, he, when he brought Timothy, Timothy wasn't circumcised, but he was half Jew. And the Apostle Paul told him, he said, look, man, it, it could hinder our ministry. Because, I mean, you were born, you were born half Jew. Your mom was a Jew. And they're not going to let us into the temple. You're, you're not going to be able to go into the temple unless you are circumcised. And so he taught. So Timothy got circumcised. But you got to understand, it's two completely different purposes. It gave Timothy access to ministry. With Titus, they were trying to say he ain't saved unless he gets circumcised. All right. So so the apostle. Paul, so then it says, and because of false brethren unaware brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So what he's saying is I brought Titus over there. He was Greek. He didn't want to be circumcised. But now these false brothers are coming around saying, oh, he ain't saved. They're wanting to st spy out our liberty and pull our liberty that we have in Christ away and put us back under bondage. Because he knew, he said, listen, if you add to your faith the works, even if it's of the Old Testament law, now you're saying that the work of Jesus wasn't enough. Now, this is relevant for us today because, listen to me, there's a lot of times whenever people don't really understand all that information that we just went through regarding ju being justified by faith, and they think that in order to make themselves pleasing in the eyes of God, 
that they're going to have to add to what Christ has already done. Like in other words, when they find themselves in failure, they think I need to read more, I need to go to church more. Listen, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but the United Pentecostals, we shared that before. And this is what's happening here. It's the same thing. I don't know. I mean, I got some people that I love that are United Pentecostal. But listen, when you say in order to be saved, you got to go in a specific tank and you got to be baptized in the whole go and you got to speak in other tongues in order to be saved. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've now changed the doctrine of salvation. And that's what they were doing here. And the Apostle Paul says, that's going to bring you under bondage. That's not going to give you freedom. All right. They were false brethren. He called them that. To whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue. In other words, we didn't listen to what they had to say. But of these who seem to be somewhat. Now he's talking about the disciples again. And I don't think he's blasting them. He's trying to make a point. Not by men, but by God and revelation of Jesus Christ. It makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. When I sat down with Peter, when I sat down with James, when I sat down with the disciples that were there, they did not add to my understanding of the scriptures. He's making his resume for the Galatians to explain to them, hey, hold on a second. I gave you the gospel. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So Peter started preaching to the Gentiles. But then that ministry was given to Paul. When they saw that. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. The same moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. Was working in the apostle Paul's ministry. The disciples saw that. And they extended the hand of fellowship to him. When James, Cephas. That's another name for Peter. And John who seemed to be pillars. Perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we would remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. <clears throat> Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So the situation is taking place now. What we have, we have a circumstance where there's been a conference. We've all agreed that the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. Peter's already had a revelation on a rooftop. Then at the conference, he actually stood up in defense of the Gentiles not having to be circumcised. Now he goes to Antioch where they're doing ministry with Gentiles. And he's sitting down and he's enjoying fellowship with the Gentile believers. So as Jew eating with Gentile, right? And the word there, as when it talks about him separating himself, it talks about a slow progression. So here come these religious leaders that say they're coming from James. They're coming from Jerusalem. And they, and now all of a sudden, Pete, once their presence is there, Peter starts to slowly, because of fear, remove himself from the presence of these Gentile believers. And the Apostle Paul said, I had to withstand him to his face. Because what he did, what Peter did, was it caused a, a major uproar mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, the, in the church that was going on. Um, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. So now all the Jews, the word dissembled literally means to play the hypocrite. They basically turned on all the Gentile believers right there. I mean, can you imagine if somebody did that to you? Like, I mean, you're sitting over here. There's a group of people. Y'all are all chilling. And then all of a sudden somebody like rolls their eyes and everybody gets up and leaves you all alone. And you're just sitting there, you know, that, that wouldn't be too cool. Right. But I mean, that's what the world does. That's what religion will do. Right. Likewise, with him in so much that Barnabas was also carried away with their hypocrisy, his friend Barnabas. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live like a Gentile and not as do the Jews, why are you trying to compel Gentiles to live like a Jew? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so essentially, I know I need to kind of really hustle up. I'm not going to try to preach the whole thing, but 
essentially what we have is this is the context for the letter to Galatians, right? Apostle Paul's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's teaching people what it truly means to be justified by faith. And there's opposition to the truth of the gospel. All right. R point number one, he was called for the gospel. Look at verse one. We're going to take a look at verse one, then verse 12, then verse 16. But he says, Paul, his calling and his teaching came from Jesus, not men. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Look at verse 12. He said, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. Verse 16b, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. You know, it's not that uncommon that someone new will come on the scene. And sometimes they'll say things a little bit differently than what we're used to. Robert and I have experienced that on a couple of occasions, even in the Bible study. There was a couple of times he's like, he even, I think he was a little irritated with me one time. He's like, dude, every time somebody new comes in to act like they're excited about Jesus, you get all caught up. And both two different times whenever it happened, he, he ended up being right. One dude came in here and he was talking all this stuff. And to be honest with you, he was flaky. Then another guy, I don't even know if you remember this guy. He, he came in with this girl and I didn't know what the deal was. She had like a veil over her head. And like, it was kind of a strange deal. But when we started, to, when I started talking to him, it was like he really did have some understanding. And it was like I wasn't just trying to shoo him off, even though he was a little bit strange. But as I was listening to the words that he was saying, it wasn't lining up. There was a whole lot of words interconnected to his message. It's almost like he wanted to come in and he wanted to inject his doctrine. And he wanted, he was like this lone wolf that was going to, you know what I'm saying, that was going to come in and, and cause a big old disturbance. And uh, the point I guess I'm trying to make is, though, is this, is that when you when you know something to be true, there's, a, there's apprehension on people's parts when somebody comes in new and is saying things differently than what you previously had heard. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is I can understand why the disciples or why many people were somewhat apprehensive about what Paul was saying because it seemed so different than what they had known all of their lives, right? Um, but uh, so anyway... He was, he was really kind of an outcast. He didn't really know most of the other disciples. I told you that Barnabas had taken him in and brought him to meet the, uh, the other disciples. And uh, we've really talked about the fact that there was this early contention in the church regarding the Jewishness of, of the Christianity. Uh, but I will say this is that, you know, there's been a longstanding problem in the church where men will, through works, They'll either try to buy through money or through works the salvation of God. But Peter even had a revelation. He explained in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. He said, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation. That's really the main point I wanted you to see right there. Vain means empty. Conversation means lifestyle. He, he said that you receive from the tradition of your fathers. I wanted to focus on that concept for a second, the tradition of your fathers. He said that's not how you were redeemed based upon the things that you had learned from the past, but instead through the precious blood of a lamb, which was foreordained before the foundation there. In other words, your fathers taught you some things. And their fathers taught them some things and their fathers taught them some things. One of the things that I noticed whenever I was in ministry in the previous church that I went to, part of a big denomination, was that everybody had specific mindsets on the way things were, right? And as soon as you tried to challenge anything, and let me tell you, I did. I got to the point where my poor, the guy that, I, he was my pastor, I mean, he really was a good dude. And. I mean, I liked him. He made me laugh. I can't. I, I don't think I've ever laughed as hard as I did whenever I was hanging out with him. But I'll be honest with you. I think I gave him an ulcer because everywhere that he brought me, every place we went to, sitting down with pastors, standing in line with pastors, they were talking. Oh, we got to renew the mind. And I was like, well, what exactly does that mean, bro? He'd get up and he's like, well, I'm gonna go give me some seconds because, like, I would want to engage him because they're they're thinking they had received from the traditions of their fathers. 
And they swallow all of this doctrine and then they just regurgitate what they have learned for years and they never took the time to study the scriptures for themselves. That's the main point I wanted to make with this. Paul's calling was from the Lord. It wasn't from men. <coughs> Paul didn't receive revelation from what other men said from the traditions of men, but instead he received the revelation from Jesus Christ himself. Amen. He says, grace and peace be unto you. The gospel that Paul preached brings grace and peace. We talked about this in the book of Romans. No reason to go through it all again, over and over again. But to say this, that because of what Jesus did, now being justified by faith, faith, we have peace with God and we have access into this grace in which we stand. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. It gives access to peace and grace. But look at this. The true gospel saves people out of this darkened world. That's what he said. I received revelation from the Lord who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. We talked about Colossians 1.13 a lot. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. He delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The whole purpose of the letter, though, was because there were perverters of truth. This is point number two. Perverters of truth. If you look at uh, verse six, so it was, a, it, it was a completely different gospel. If you look at verse six, the wording in, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter one, verse six. He says, I marvel. The idea there is he was astonished. I'm astonished. That you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I wanted you to see another. Okay, but, but look at this. So soon removed. It's almost like as soon as I got on the boat and headed down to Corinth, th these people came in here and they've already pulled you away from what it was that I took the time to teach you. And we have to be careful because there's a lot of false doctrine out there. There's perverters of truth even still today. I know sometimes y'all think that I go on and on about that too much, um, but I'll, I'll just be honest with you. Is I, I only say that because I know it to be true and I try to help protect, but at the same time, I'm not going to control. There's got to be a balance. You want to protect, but you can't control. Can't tell people who they should listen to. Can't tell people where they should go to church. They have to determine it on their own. I don't want to control nobody. If you don't, you know what I'm saying? If somebody, I mean, I don't want to just say things offensively and get people to get up and leave. I don't want to do that. But, but if I try to hold on to people, I've been in churches where preachers try to hold on to people. They scared you're going to go visit somebody else's church. If, if, if the Lord's leading you to go visit somebody else's church and that's where you end up going to church and that's God's will for your life. But it, guess what? Sometimes you might think it's God's will, but it's not. I'm just saying. But if I try to hold on to you, that's a control spirit. Do you want to be controlled? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be controlled. I don't want nobody other than the Lord telling me what I'm supposed to do, right? All right, so in that next verse, this is, so go to the next verse, another gospel, which is not another. The word another is used twice there, but it's two different Greek words. The first one is heteros, which means a completely different kind, which means like a different gospel. The second one is alos, which is kind of like whenever the Lord said he's going to send another comforter. It's, a, it's one like me. See what I'm saying? So what basically Paul's saying is you've now ventured into something that's not even the gospel of Jesus Christ. Adding works to the established faith by grace that Jesus accomplished on the cross, you now have ventured into a completely different gospel. So it wasn't just a departure from theology, but instead it was actually a departure from the Lord himself. Uh, this different gospel would bring chaos. Look, look at this. Well, actually, look at verse 7. He said that this different gospel was a perversion of the gospel and would pervert the gospel of Christ, which means to put in reverse. We're now, the law is in our back, is in our rear view mirror, but now what these guys are teaching, we're going in reverse and we're going back under a system of law. Listen, I'm telling you right now, you would be surprised. This is so relevant, and maybe you don't even understand how relevant it is because some of you got saved and started coming to this church, and this is all you've heard since the day that you got saved. But I'm here to tell you that 90% of the churches around here, 95, 97, 98, 
probably 99%, oh, you think you got it all figured out. No, we don't have it all figured out. But what I will tell you is this. The majority of churches preach a works-based message when it comes to sanctification or living for the Lord on a daily basis. And that's exactly what these men in Galatia were doing, coming back behind the Apostle Paul, changing the doctrine, changing the object of faith from Jesus Christ and Him crucified, which allows grace to flow into works that you now have to add and it frustrates the grace of God and it prevents what it is that you need from the Lord to help you walk in victory. And that's just, that's the facts. Amen. I've had one preacher and you don't even have to erase this off the tape. And every time I see him, he keeps telling me the same thing. If you're watching, then I don't agree with you because I'm being sweet and I hadn't wanted to say anything. We, we've already had our issues, but we keep talking about the fact that, that I think that preachers are like bus drivers. And we're all taking people to the same destination. We just got to make different stops. And if we only had one bus driver, and if we all went to the same place and we did ministry the same, then there, then there wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't need different bus drivers or whatever the case. Well, that's fine if we got different buses. And even if we're bringing them all to different locations, as long as... We're all preaching the Alas gospel, another of the same kind. The issue is, though, that we're not all preaching the same gospel. Just because you got Jesus in your message, just because you got the cross in your message, just because you got the word blood in your message, and every now and then you mention sin does not mean that you're preaching the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because if you add works to your grace, now you've changed it, you've amalgamated it. What is that? A weird mixture to where it's not the same same thing. Plus, then in addition to the works-based the mixture, you got cycle theology now. An amalgamation where we take psychology along with theology. Listen to me, this stuff is rampant in the church. Where you put this all together and now it's like it sounds good. The wisdom of a man mixed with the wisdom. No, no, it's not good. It's garbage. And the wisdom of God is not good to mix with the wisdom of man because the wisdom of man is devilish and sensual. It comes from demon spirits. It didn't come from the Lord. Oh, but if it helps people, it must be from God. No. Freud might try to help you, but at the same time, he's going to kill you. That's not good. The devil does the same thing. He mixes a little bit of leaven with the truth and the mixture is more dangerous. I'd rather you come right here and tell me that Jesus wasn't God because at least I know where you stand. Now you're going to sit here and you're going to add a little psychology, a little tincture of this, a little tincture of that. And you're going to make it hard for me to be able to figure out what it is. And I'm just sitting over here like receiving it like it's good. And in reality, I'm drinking like Robert says, drinking from a poisoned well. And don't even realize it. I've heard stories before and I never listened. Well, it is what it is. I've, I've watched movies before where people killed somebody in the family with poison. And when they use arsenic. And they just like a little tincture, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And then slowly over a period of time, it kills them. They do an autopsy and they find this poison in their body because it stays in there for a long time. But this process was slow and insidious. And the same thing happens with false doctrine. It's a little bit at a time. Slowly kills, slowly destroys, slowly takes away. It's a different gospel. And look, so it perverted, it brought them backwards. But look at verse 7. This different gospel, not, it's not only a perversion, but it brings chaos instead of peace. Because in verse 7, the apostle Paul said that this gospel, look at this, that they would trouble you. The word trouble means to stir up or to agitate. When a person is not in the true gospel, it means that they've taken a venture out of the truth or they're attempting to live for God outside of the truth. And the result of that is not going to be peace, but instead it's going to be chaos. Listen, Satan will use both angels and men to pervert the gospel. Look at verse 8. I'm about to close after this. Verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now listen. When I read this and started studying a little bit deeper into this, I'm telling you, this was a sobering message for the preacher. And this should be a sobering message for every preacher that might happen to listen to this video or watch this video. I got a text while I was working on my message yesterday from a preacher. He was like, man, I watched your reboot to produce fruit. And it was, it was good. You know, so he was encouraging me. I was like, well, praise God. So I know there's at least a couple of preachers, but that dude's got good theology. So, but, it, but listen, what I need you to know is this, is that that word accursed right there, 
It doesn't mean just need some discipline. I mean, that'd be one thing, right? Like, you know, in other words, uh, your pre preachers are people and we mess up, right? And the Lord chastises those whom he loves. And, and discipline's one thing, but that's not what that word means. It's anathema. It means to be turned over for condemnation. That's how serious this is. Hey, preacher! That's how serious this is. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation history, all that God would prepare for man in advance to prepare this nation out of one man named Abraham to give us the Christ so that he could die on the cross to pay the penalty of man's sin. Hallelujah. And now mankind preachers are going to add to that and change the very doctrine that God has given to man in order to be saved. The Apostle Paul says, if an angel does it, if another man does it, let him be anathema. Let him be turned over to condemnation. Serious business. Man ought not be messing with the word of God. Amen. Paul knew all too well that Satan would stop at nothing. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Y'all just bear with me. Give me five more minutes. So that we can finish this part. We're almost done here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 1 through 4. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. So he's writing to the Corinthians next verse. He says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, he said, I preached the gospel to you. And then when you got saved, it was like you entered into an espousal or a betrothal. You are now engaged to Jesus. And we're in this engagement period now till one day our marriage with him is going to be consummated. But in the meantime, there might be a, some kind of cheater that's trying to get you. To be deceived. He says right here. He says, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Next verse. For if he come preaching another Jesus. He's got the name of Jesus in the message. Or if you receive another spirit. It's got a spirit connected to it. Every time you feel the free zones or you get some emotional stuff or you even shed a tear or you laugh or your tummy gets tickled or you get goosebumps, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the Holy Spirit. Satan is a spirit. Amen. People that I've talked to that are, that are of other religions, let's be politically correct, they said, oh, I see the God in the deer. And when I see that God in that deer, that life that's in that deer, and I know that I'm one with that deer... Oh, that feels so good. It makes me feel so good to know that I'm one with nature. You and I are one. That's what she said. We're one right here. What we're doing is one. I said, ma'am, I don't mean to be rude, and I know I'm at work, and probably maybe we went too far with this conversation, but we ain't one because we got the same spirit that's living inside of a deer. No, we're not one. In other words, you know, you can only be one with God if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what my Bible teaches. I'm not trying to offend you. But the serpent, he's got a, he's a spirit, and he will make you feel real comfortable. He says, or another gospel. So it's a different Jesus, it's a different spirit, and it's another gospel, which you have not accepted. You might, well, bear with it. Now, let's jump down to th verse 13, because this is what he's talking about right here. He says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. Don't be surprised by this because look at this. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Next verse. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works, which is destruction. The point being is that the Apostle Paul was very well that there were false teachers that were perverting the gospel. And he also understood that, listen, there were angels that were behind the whole thing. Fallen angels, Satan, a fallen angel. Is, is behind the whole thing, demonic spirits behind the whole thing, causing men to follow the traditions of other errors and problems and disseminating that information to the people of God and causing confusion. 
I'm just going to close with this idea. Point number three was it takes time to learn the truth. But instead of reading it, I'm just going to remind you that the Apostle Paul said, I did not confer immediately with men, but instead I went into Arabia. I went into the wilderness. He was away for a period of time. It, it, you know, up to 14 years. There was a period of time where the Apostle Paul was alone. And in that process of time, the main point that I wanted to make to you is, I can't prove it. He doesn't exactly say it like that, but it had to be that during that time was when his Romans 7 experience took place. Because his Romans 7 experience is very clear from the scriptures that he was a Christian, and that after Christianity, he turned around and he embraced the law again. And when he did, the power of sin regained dominion in his life and caused a frustration in his life. So essentially, when he writes to the Galatian believers, he's saying, he's like probably like pulling his hair out like, no, don't do it. I've already done it myself when I was in the Arabian desert or there was a period of time in my Christianity that I tried to add law to my faith and it frustrated the grace of God. And the very thing I knew I wasn't supposed to do, that was what I did. And the thing that I wanted to do, I couldn't do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Don't do it. Don't believe the perverters of the gospel. I'm so marveled. I marvel that you are so soon turned away.